This lecture may seem to be kind of a distraction, a detour from going through all the various Isabel facilities we have. But this is, if you like, talking a little more about mathematical tools. Because you can't do a lot without sets. Uh, so in this lecture, we will be talking about the various ways you uh, write and operate on sets in Isabel. Um, funnily enough, you know, I try to relate the course to other proof assistants as well. Mostly, there is much less of an emphasis on sets. In the case of type theories, it's because really sets don't work very well. So they will often refer to setoids, which are, I'm not quite sure what they are, but they are mostly used in the phrase setoid hell, which is not very promising. And in higher order logic, so in the Paul um, ecosystem, they tend to identify sets with logical predicates, which makes perfect sense mathematically, but often then you lose sort of really basic things, like no one talks about the intersection of two predicates, for example. So this will be much more Isabel focused, perhaps, than it ought to be. So anyway, so set notation. It's mostly pretty obvious and natural. Um, I, maybe I should say, you've all heard of union and intersection, surely, and I guess you've all come across a power set operator as well, you know, the set of all subsets of something. Quite basic for doing absolutely anything. Now, already when you come to function, some of the ideas are somehow less well known. So the image, so you have a function, use that function to take the image of a set, a bit like the map functional in ML. Very basic thing. Then there's the inverse image or pre-image in which you have your function, you have a set which has been mapped to by the function and you wonder what was the origin set that could give rise to this. Then of course the fun composition of two functions um, a few things to do with relations that may be a bit more obvious. And finally, and actually one of the trickier things will be the notion of a description. This is, in fact, the <clears throat> formal analogs of the English words um, A or the. So where you refer to a thing by a description of its properties rather than by actually constructing it. Are, so logically speaking, a logical predicate and a set, a, these are tight sets, are the same thing in higher order logic. Uh, so it's just a matter of, if you like, um, how we view it. You know, we normally think of a predicate as being a property of an object then when we collect all objects with the property, we have a set, sometimes called the extension of the property. And yes, to repeat myself, this is a kind of set theory where all elements have the same type, so it is not at all to be confused with, let's say, a Zervilo Frankel set theory, where you, which you may have heard of, which is a totally different beast. Although, little aside, you can have zermilo frankel set theory in high order logic simply as an extension. So you can say, I have a type, which is all zermilo frankel sets, and you give it all the axioms of set theory, and suddenly you have a whole copy of set theory sitting inside higher order logic, and then you can do some quite cool stuff with that. Okay, now the line at the bottom there, I've had to change this. So the built-in type alpha set, of course alpha is the type argument, is in essence the same as the predicate type alpha arrow bool. Now, I guess I've been teaching this course for about 10 years, and for about three of those years, that line said they are the very same type, because some guys at Munich had the clever idea, why don't we make them as actually the same so that alpha set simply abbreviates alpha arrow bool. And I told them not to, but they, they gave it a try and they actually realized things don't work so well. The, the, the reasons are kinda, 
Let's just say there are very much practical operational reasons that if you, um, once you introduce actual functions, a lot of things behave differently, especially things to do with unification. Life becomes a lot harder. So in fact, this type alpha set is lot, kind of, if you like, morally the same as these, set, as these um, Boolean value functions. And they're morally the same as predicates, but they are not literally the same in the formalism. And that will make some theorem proving operations work better. Okay, now what are our primitives? Things like membership, the membership in a set, subsets. You've all had a discrete math course, I'm sure, so you've seen all these many a time. The idea of a comprehension, that is to say, the set of all x such that some property, and the empty set which we write with a pair of brackets like that. So the traditional phi symbol does not work here. We have a universal set, and before any of you scream Russell's paradox, remember we have a tight set theory here. So the universal set is simply it will be types, it will be just a set of all natural numbers, big deal. It's the same thing as the type itself. No paradox there. You, you cannot write Russell's paradox. In fact, the membership relation won't let you because the x in y, x will have type alpha, y will have type alpha set. So there is no way you can even write x member of x. So I suppose it's worth mentioning some of these rather obvious uh, identities, if only to make it clearer what we're talking about and actually to show you the syntax. So I haven't, that is a syntax of a set comprehension, the thing within the braces. It's pretty similar to what you'll see in a textbook. One little quirk, so you see the dot there, x dot. Uh, I know that books will normally use a vertical bar there and that's a traditional notation. So being a computer scientist, I tried to have some harmony in the syntax. So anything where you have a variable such as x followed by a dot is going to be a binding of that variable. So I'm trying to make it a little easier to remember. Justice for all exists and various other things have a variable name followed by a dot. So that's why we write the syntax like that. Vertical bar will not work here. Um, this combination is also allowed, so if you want to have x's ranging over a set satisfying a property, it has that obvious meaning. We have the complement of a set, again, defined no problems because we have tight sets, so we have a universal set, therefore we also have the complement. Union, intersection, these are surely very obvious. Power set, I hope you all remember. Uh, power set's quite useful to express certain things. So those are the simplest ones. Then we go up a level, the big ones. Um, again, I, this should be kind of obvious. So what is the union, if you like, that is an indexed union. So that is a union for all x, and of course, X is necessarily of a particular type of a family of sets which we write as B of X, you know, for X ranging over an entire type, whatever that type may be. And to be a member of that union, it holds exactly if um, E belongs to some particular one of the Bs for some particular X. In fact, it's often more useful to have an index set. So you see the second one here with the union of all x ranging over a. It's turned out to be more natural in many cases. So an explicit index set that we are forming the union over. And I hope that the, oh, and actually I'm introducing something there. I never thought about it. That is something new as well. You see there it says exists x belonging to a, blah, is a quantifier ranging over a set, sometimes called a bounded quantifier. So yeah, those are actually also part of the set theory development. Uh, this last one may look a bit weird to you. So simply the big union of a set A 
if you like, it is a union index by itself. So you belong, at E belongs to this big union of A. It simply means all the elements of A unioned together. Um, and so E belongs to that just if E belongs to some element of A. So that looks a bit weird. So very few mathematical, very little mathematical material will write that unless you're looking at set theory where that kind of thing will pop in more than you like. Um, intersection works okay here. Now you see in general set theory where you don't have complements, intersection can be rather badly behaved. But here we do. So if you change all of those union symbols into intersection symbols and all those existentials into universals, I think it will work without any problem whatever. Okay, well, now we have a little example. Um, I kind of like this. So those, the theorem there, it's not very easy to see. Actually, it's two theorems. So if you look closely, you'll see that there are two lines and each line is a pretty horrendous complication of unions and intersections. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about exactly what they mean. Just to say this sort of thing, so if these were assigned to you as a discrete math problem, you would probably be rather annoyed it might take you half an hour to do the, to both of them. Although there's, like, there's nothing really deep here. Um, Very, very easy to do automatically. I have to say, it took a lot of work to get here. I remember working on these like 30 years ago. It wasn't so easy. Oh, by the way, now I've, I've told you this before, the little dot telling you that it's trivial. And if, have, you, have any of you tried actually hovering over these mysterious indicators in the corner where you get a pop-up? So you see, the other thing you can do is put the cursor there and look at the output buffer. But if you don't want to actually click and, and switch into the output buffer, you can just get the pop-up window to work. And you know, this is actually live text in the pop-up window, so you can hover over those variables and find their types. Uh, you'll see that the variables are still colored correctly with the, the blues and the greens telling you whether it's a bound variable or a free variable and all that, even in the pop-up window. Uh, you could also, ah, it's not even that it's provable by auto. It's noticed that one of those theorems is an exact instance, or in fact, it's a copy. Yeah, it's an exact copy of a theorem already stored in the system. Uh, and you can, in fact, if you hover click over the name of the theorem, it will jump you right into where that theorem is proved. So pop-up windows are useful. Okay, moving on to functions. Um, that funny back quote is the image operator. Now, this is a stupid thing. Um, I read Whitehead and Russell's Principia Mathematica, the paperback edition, which in fact, those of you who went, or who are in part three, who went to my logic and proof, and saw me hold up the paperback edition. Uh, I probably told you it was cheap, and it was cheap then because I bought it in heifers for I'm sure something like seven pounds. Now it is something like 70, which is a crime because it's still the same little paperback. I don't know what they're doing. Nevertheless, um, if you get hold of a copy, there's some interesting stuff there. If you are interested in the history of the development of formal logic going back to the start of the 20th century, there it is. Um, so that F back quote A it is very close to the syntax used by Russell and Whitehead. And when I needed an operator, I thought, why not? Now, mathematicians these days typically will just say F applied to A in parentheses. So they expect you to know that because it's a capital A, it's a set, whereas if it were a little a, it would be an element. And that if you apply a function to a set that implicitly implies the image, 
even though, of course, sets themselves are values, and in certain branches, like in set theory, why shouldn't I apply a function to a set? Because, in fact, in set theory, everything is a set, including the function itself. So here, and in fact, this is a general problem with formalizing mathematics in any system. You have, on the one hand in your book, a beautiful language of mathematics, which is full of ambiguities, but which we can just read and understand very naturally. And then on the other hand, uh, we have the requirements of an unambiguous machine notation. So anyway, sorry, a bit of a distracted babble there, but F back quote A or F image A, that's the image of A through F, I suppose. E belongs to that precisely if E is equal to F of X for some value of X, which is in A. Pre-image or inverse image, and you see the, the syntax is minus back quote, is kind of the obvious. So here, A is now a set of values in the range of F, and E belongs to the pre-image of A, just if F of E itself belongs to A. This next one, so this uh, colon equals, is mostly used for programming language semantics. But very common in semantics are two things that one is often doing. One is to update the state of a machine. The state of the machine will be represented by a function from locations to values. We're going to see exactly this in the lecture on semantics in a couple of weeks. So then when somebody makes an assignment to a location, the new machine state is the same function except it's been altered at one place, the argument x, which we have set so that f of x should now be mapped to y which is exactly what this is saying. So f with x colon equal y is the same function as f except for the value it returns when applied to x itself, a particular x. Um, tons of other properties of functions exist, such as the property of being injective or being injective when restricted to a certain set, the idea of being surjective, bijective, the inverse of a function. We also can look at the inverse of a function if we are restricting its domain, <clears throat> many, many other things. And all of these, you see, because in some systems these notions are not very well developed, which means that when you do your work, you have to reinvent them all the time, and you are just making extra work for yourself. You know, it's quite interesting to know that, have I got it right, the pre-image of an open set through a continuous function is an open set. But you can't have that theorem if you don't know what a pre-image is. Okay, on to finite sets. Kind of obvious. So if you write a finite number of terms in curly brackets like that, it expands into that thing, so we have an insert function um, which has got a pretty obvious interpretation. So for computer scientists, this is just list cons, except it isn't a list. Now, that was a notation for finite sets. Now for the concept of being a finite set, now, it's funny, this actually is a rather complicated thing in the, shall we say, the foundations of mathematics, where, for example, we have what they call a dedicate, dedicant infinite set as opposed to a non-dedicate, or some dedicate, sorry, let me start again. The word is dedicant, named after a mathematician of that name, who defined, I think, a set to be infinite if it is, um, can be put in bijection with a proper subset of itself. That is a kind of cool definition mathematically, but it is not so useful as, for example, a set being infinite if it cannot be put in bijection with the natural numbers. Uh, and I think you need the axiom of choice or something to prove that they are equivalent 
which is really not a rabbit hole we want to go down right here. So here we have, um, since we have inductive definitions at a much lower level, and in fact we will see them in the lecture or two, I will actually talk for a whole lecture on inductive definitions. So if we imagine starting with the empty set and then having the ability to iterate the insert operator, I want to say any finite number of times, then you're going to say that finite is defined uh, circularly or something. But in fact, the, the notion of inductive definition kind of in, gives us a notion of finiteness. So any set which either is the empty set or, how do you put it? It has the form of the empty set or of the form insert x a where a is already a finite set and there are no other sets than those will turn out to give you all the finite sets. And from that, and again we will look at that definition itself soon, you can prove all sorts of super obvious facts which are in fact available to us. Uh, so this thing about the cardinality of the power set which is absolutely fundamental and countless other things. And in fact, the library also has a rather extensive um, set of theorems about countable sets. Okay, the last, another thing that we will really use a lot of are the notions of intervals. Um, can you see there are, I guess, well, I've written six there, but there are more. The thing is, if you have an upper and a lower bound, we have the question of whether the interval is strict or not. So I guess the first four are ha what they call half intervals. So, in, um, so you see the very first one is the set of everything strictly less than u. The one just below is the set of everything less than or equal to u. Then going in the other way, we have the set of everything strictly greater than L, the set of everything greater than or equal to L. So those are the, if you like, the four kinds of N brackets with a greater than sign or without a, or sorry, that's a less than sign, without a less than sign. And you see the last two intervals have got given you two of the possible, combina of the f possible combinations for a thing with a lower and an upper bound. Of course, there are, in fact, a total of four possible combinations there. So they all, all four of them are defined. Um, why do we need these? Well, they're used all over the place, but in particular, they're always used for sums and products. So you may find yourself forming the sum over an interval, and you can do it in all these different ways. And you can write it like that. And in fact, you can even write it in a better way than that. So you can, <coughs> excuse me, you can write things like sum uh, i less than k of something and other things besides. Moving on, OK. Something tricky. Um, well, the first two bullet points are not really descriptions, but whatever. I guess they are talking about things, I guess any of them may not be defined. So if, in the first case, if I have a finite non-empty set that is at least a semi-lattice, then you can take the minimum and the maximum. Now, it, for min and max, it has to be non-empty. So this is, if you like, a very naive notion of minimum and maximum, uh, where the minimum of the empty set is simply not defined because what does it mean to be the minimum of nothing, right? Same, same for max. But if the argument is non-empty and finite, then we're done. Um, Next line is more interesting. So infant soup. Now maybe you've not come across this. Depends on how much maths you've done. So the inf, the infimum, and the supremum are a generalization of min and max, which 
could even be the, um, the, the suit, the upper bound of an infinite set, or the infimum, the lower bound of an infinite set. Um, so typically, the soup has the property of being greater than everything in the set, greater than or equal than, and being the least such. And the inf is the dual of that. Now, it depends on the properties of the type. So if your type is a complete lattice, I guess it will always be defined. If it's a complete lattice, it even has a maximum element. Um, if it's not a complete lattice, what do they call it, conditionally complete, then you have the soup of every set that has an upper bound, even if it's an infinite set, as long as it has an upper bound, then you have this, the supreme. And this is like the reals, for example. So there is no maximum real. However, if you have any bounded set of reals, has a supremum, that is a least upper bound, uh, which may or may not be in the set itself. So if you look, for example, at the set of all elements, all real numbers, um, such that the square of x is less than 2, then the supremum of that set will be the square root of 2. And it's actually not in the set. Um, so what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to give you the difference between supremum and max. Because max, it has to be a finite set. And of course, the max will be a member of the set. Anyway, you need them all to express mathematical things. Now, the last one is kind of a tricky one, and maybe I regret not giving it a slide of its own because it's really quite a tricky thing. So, in the real world, um, let's see, in the real world, in the real world, I guess things mostly have names, and mostly we refer to someone by their name. But if you're not sure, you might say something like the tall guy standing in the corner and then you don't know his name but there's only one tall guy standing in the corner and so you've identified him and that's how it works in English and if there is no tall guy standing in the corner or maybe there's not even a corner um, then you've got a problem now in mathematics this kind of thing happens all the time so in mathematics we very often prove a theorem giving the existence of a thing. And then later on, you need to refer to this. Now, there will be occasions, so if, you, if this is happening in the middle of um, a proof you're doing that I have exists x, p of x, then your usual existential elimination rule will simply give you p of x, and you're done. But sometimes that isn't what you are able to do. And for example, you might need to define a function that produces these things kind of iteratively, and then that option isn't available to you. So you need some other way of referring to a thing that exists. So this Hilbert operator, which is written sum and takes a variable, so x, which is a great variable name, so what I've written there is sum x such that f of x equals 0. Now that, there are two possibilities. Either such an x exists, in which case sum will give us one of them. We have no idea which one, but it will give us one. Or it's possible that no such x exists, in which case value of sum can be anything at all, but it will have the expected type, whatever the type of x is. So we, it's a description because that value, sum x such that f of x equals 0, is being denoted by a property, namely f of x equals 0. Um, and if indeed, so if, for example, we have as a theorem somewhere f of a equals 0, now that does not tell us that this thing equals a because there might be a more than one solution. Um, but it does tell us that because it tells us there's at least one solution, it tells us that this sum of x thing will itself also be a root of f. Um, these are kind of tricky to reason about, but I just thought I should mention them. If you find yourself working with descriptions, then possibly you're in for a rough time.
Well, this has got nothing to do with Elon Musk. Okay, so let's look at some actual Isabel. Okay, we saw that other proof and that was automatic. Now, what does this thing say? Um, finite, A being finite shows us that, I see, the sum indexed over A of C times Fi equals C times that sum. Um, okay. This is a kind of obvious distributive law, but we should look at how to prove it. Uh, we've seen fixes before. I am fixing the type of C to be real. You may have discovered already, very unpleasantly, that if you type a little example with, let's say, an asterisk for multiplication, and if there's nothing else to constrain the type, you might find you can't prove anything. And that's because the mere existence of multiplication doesn't imply the reals or something. And you will have you find yourself, it will assume some very weak type for which basically nothing is known. And then you can't even prove that zero times x equals zero because it doesn't know that you're talking about that sort of type. So that's why to keep it simple, I just said c is a real number. There, in fact, this is proved for some much more general thing like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, integral domains or something of that sort. But we, no one cares about that at the moment. So let's do our proof. Um, so A is a finite set. Now, I haven't told you about how we set up finite yet, but we will see it later. But never mind, there is an induction rule for finite sets. So we do induction on A using the rule for finite induction. And what does this do? There you see the two sub-goals that we were given. And in particular, you see the base case is the empty set's been substituted in. And you see in the inductive step, we have insert XF. So that is a fairly straightforward thing. We do auto, and we're not quite finished. What is the problem here? Uh, we have to look quite carefully, as I said. Look carefully at what's missing. So what have we got? We've got C times FX there and c times the sum, that's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we've got c times the sum together. So we need a distributive law here. And the easiest way to do it is to use this thing, algebra sims, which I probably told you about a long time ago, and which you forgot about because it's boring. Algebra sims bundles up together a whole bunch of really obvious facts about addition, multiplication, and 0 and 1. And we'll solve a whole bunch of things like this. Um, one last remark, actually. Now, this will seem really ugly to you, but this is how it goes. Turns out we don't even need the finite A here. Now, why is that? Well, it's quite simple. Sum and product are defined so that if the index set is infinite, they just return the neutral value. So sum of an infinite set will just be 0 product of an infinite set will just be 1. Um, this has, by the way, got nothing to do with infinite sums and products in analysis, which have to be treated like limits. So this is just saying that if you're trying to do a normal finite summation and you don't give it a finite index set, these will, by default, equal 0. Now, I think for some people, you'll say, well, that's kind of an ugly clue, isn't it? Um, and maybe it is ugly, but it allows us to get rid of the finite condition there, because in the infinite case, both sides are zero anyway. So this kind of little hack is quite important in automated theorem proving, because it allows us over and over again to have, like that could be unconditional, that is getting rid of the finite assumption, and the more unconditional things that you have, the easier it is to do your work. Big Dilbert time.
Well, funny thing, actually, if you replaced morals and values by intuition, the, the, in, the word intuition is very funny because sometimes if you say someone does things by intuition, you mean they can't think. But in fact, when you talk about a real genius, genius is typically someone who has an intuition for, let's say, the behavior of subatomic particles or for uh, properties of some weird and wonderful mathematical domain that some people can barely understand. So in fact, intuition is a useful thing to have. Okay, now to finish up, I want to talk about a random assortment of other things which we have in Isabel and which are good to know about. So counterexample finding was one of the things they did at Munich and it really is a genius piece of work. The point is, most of the things we try to prove aren't theorems. Now this reminds me, this actually started off uh, as debug a debugging tool for progr functional programming language. So long ago they invented quick check for a functional programming language where if you're defining a function and you want it to have certain properties, the obvious thing you can do is just test it, right? I mean, testing is okay. It's very limited and dumb, but it's a whole lot better than nothing if, you know, in, instead of trying to figure out in some more painstaking way. So have an automatic um, and intelligently driven test case generator, to put it in that language, is a useful thing to have. And this has been jacked up to quite a high level now so what Isabel has, so it has its own quick check. Um, these are quite sophisticated. So in particular, um, nitpick can make sense of an awful lot of stuff that doesn't even look computable. So it turns out there are a lot of ways in which you can take a problem or take so, uh, some specifications abstract them until they're finite, then give it to a SAT solver and somehow find out something about the original problem. And the other thing, and I think especially in the case of quick check, um, sometimes the thing you're trying to prove has the form P implies Q. And let's suppose P is almost never true. Now, if you just do random testing, most of the time P will be false and Q is not even going to be attempted. And that is not really a test. So the clever thing to do is, when you have P implies Q, generate a bunch of test data, all of which actually satisfies P. Then you're assuring that the Q part is actually being checked. And that is, I think, quick check is able to do in places like that. Um, have any of you guys tried the try keyword? So try is for lazy people. You see, it's, they, they chose the name try on purpose instead of, for example, make a first attempt. So they just called it try. And what that will do is it calls everything. Uh, and if you're lucky, one of them will come back and decide the thing you're trying to prove for you. And yes, um, you have to type them in the document. So I know it looks ugly, and in fact, I don't like, please don't hand in work that has random debugging commands in it. So take them out when you're finished. But yeah, because of the way the um, Isabel works, to get any of these commands to work, you have to type. If you want to have it checked, just type out nitpick right there, and it will do its stuff. So here's an example. Okay, this is not a theorem, right? This says the complement of A union B is the complement of A union the complement of B. Well, it's obviously not true. So this is a broken version of De Morgan's law. And of course, we have the little thing that tells us. So again, keep your eye open for those little blue dots. And I actually think it's clever that it finds it so quickly. I see quick check did this. And that's interesting because it didn't even need, so you might imagine that A and B would need to be like sets of integers before quick check could do anything, but no, it doesn't need that. 
it somehow doesn't care about the type and it's able to say, well, look, let B be the empty set and now A can be anything and it just doesn't work, that's all. And then it even tells you there, I don't quite know what list.coset means even now, but I guess it's telling you that the left-hand side is not empty and the right-hand side is going to be empty. Okay, a few more general remarks. Yes, don't learn the built-in lemmas. The automatic tools that we have are quite powerful when it comes to sets. So we have, in fact, that hundreds needs to be thousands now. But the other thing is to find So I don't know, maybe some of you have stumbled across the query button yourselves. But if not, there, do you see what says query? So you click on that and you can see there are some panels, but the thing is, the fine theorems is the most uh, useful, although try clicking on the others, especially print context can be useful to remind you of what's available, what kind of local variables are defined in the particular place where you are. But going back to find theorems, what you can do is type some pattern. So there, what have I done here? I'm afraid that's not very legible. So the first thing I typed was the intersection of two underscores. Underscore means anything, right? The next pattern I typed is a union of two underscores, and the third one is card, which is the name of a function. Um, now, these search fields are always regard regarded as conjunctive, so we are asking for theorems satisfying everything. There's no way of putting in a disjunctive query, I'm afraid. So, out of the entire system, only those two theorems exist. So they have the function card, which is the cardinality of a set, the union and intersection. So you see they're found very quickly and of course this is quite a useful thing. <laughs>